friends all good afternoon. Uh, today I'm going to speak, I know it's kind of a long title, but um, it's really the Malay world. It's really about the Malay world. So, as we know, Magellan came, and it wasn't the first time for him to come into Asia when he came to the Philippines. So, actually, um, in 1509, he was already in Malacca. So, if you look at this um, map of the eastern side, to the eastern side of the of uh, of the world, um, I look into what two historians uh, looked at. Uh, Chowdhury and also Janet Abulubun to look at the world, the Malay world, uh, or, or that part of the world before the uh, 1500s. And so here, I look into the three circuits. The three circuits, so the first circuit being, well, Aden, Hormuz, and then you have um, these would be traders from particularly Africa and um, the, the Arab world. And um, the second circuit would look into the, the India side, the Corbandel coast and the Malabar coast. And the third circuit, and uh, for me, uh, we would look into Malacca. So if you look at the, the, that part of the world, that map, you would see that um, this is uh, the world that Magellan came into. This is the world that he saw. So what is this uh, world particularly? So in the Eastern Circuit, we believe that this was the sea joining the east coast of Indochina, northern shore of Java, with the great ports of South China, and under the hegemony of the Sung, Yuan, and Ming, um, navies. This is seen as the realm of Buddhism, Confucianism, and Taoism involving uh, what scholars call uh, the tribute trade. But important for me here is uh, Malacca because it sat at the confluence of the Eastern and Middle Circuits. It was also no small coincidence that this was where the monsoon winds met and it was a safe harbor for merchant ships. So according to Abu Lugud, in the port emporia that were meeting places for merchants and emissaries, representatives from the three culture zones were likely to mingle and to trade ideas as well as goods. So there, in that part, whenever there were major infusions from one cultural zone to the another, such as the movement of Islam into Malaya and Indonesia, these were achieved through beachheads that had been established in the Emporia. And so, Malacca became a great emporium, not only for goods, but ideas as well. The propagation of Malay as a lingua franca, of Islam, and of cultural practices as well. I'm bringing something that was found much, much earlier. So this was found in the Belitung uh, shipwreck. Uh, Belitung is uh, somewhere in what is now called Indonesia. This is one of thousands of artifacts. But I, what I want to do, and this, um, if you look at the trade ceramics, it would, they call it the Tang um, shipwreck, but I would call it the Belitung shipwreck. Tang because of the ceramics. They were dating the ceramics. So around. Um, in, uh, 9th century to uh, 11th uh, century. But here, uh, what is important for me and to give an example to you all is what takes place in the global trade. As early as this time, you have, for example, so, this is one of so many, where the kiln for the making of this ceramic comes from China and yet the cobalt that is used is from Persia, and the design is Persian, and the ship that was, that, that, that was wrecked in the Belitu, in what is now Indonesia, is of Oman, Oman Bay. So here, uh, what I'm trying to really show is 
all these interconnections that were going on even as early as hundreds of years before the, the coming of, um, before 1500s. So here it shows um, the kiln and the, 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 the passageway of the, the Bentu uh, shipwreck. The Song Dynasty, and then I go on to the Mongols, but in Malacca as well. Um, here we have uh, the naval ex expedition of someone named Chen Po, and for whatever reason, he had his own reason, he made Malacca something like a base for his um, expeditions. So, here the main Admiral Chen Ho of the legendary seven voyages to Southeast Asia, the Indian Ocean, and perhaps the, uh, beyond, visited many established ports in the region, but apparently favored Malacca for reasons unknown over earlier um, existing ports. Now, Mawan, he also had his own uh, version of Pigafetta, Mawan, the Chinese interpreter who accompanied uh, Chen He in three of his seven voyages, describes and sheds light on the well-organized arrangements of the Malacca Sultanate with regard to trade. So, for example, whenever the treasure ships of the central uh, country arrived there, they at once erected a line of stockading like a city wall and they set up towers for the watch drums at four gates. At night, they had patrols of police carrying bells. Inside, they erected a second stockade like a small city wall within which they constructed warehouses and granaries and all the money and provisions were stored in them. You know, you know the word um, godang or a warehouse? So it came from the word godang. And uh, that is where they, they stored things. So the ships which had gone to various countries returned to this place and assembled, and they marshaled the foreign goods and loaded them in the ships that waited till the south wind was perfectly favorable. So that was Chen Ho, and he made Malacca. And um, some historians, like Jeff Wei, for example, believe that it was because of the selection of Malacca as their base that uh, made Malacca like the, like the center of trade. So um, here, what we have here is the book of useful information by Bin Majid. Okay. Um, Ahmad bin Majid's The Book of Useful uh, Information on the Principles and Rules of Navigation, originally prepared around 1490s, is detailed expansion of earlier Arab sea manuals, building upon earlier cartography, navigation, and codification. For example, in the 11th Faida of this work, bin Majid gives detailed advice about the monsoons, the sailing seasons when one should travel, and the intervals between the monsoons. So this was translated by, by Tibet, but he did a list of all the times, the different times, when one should So in sailing, you know, when's the, when's the season of the wind, and so you follow it, and actually, there's a rumor, or some people think that Vasco de Ma, the Gama, actually had Bin Majid as his guide. But of course, um, Tibets who researched on this said that could not possibly be. But uh, just to show you the information that was there um, in terms of cartography, especially among um, Arab merchants who sailed this um, for, for centuries. So for example, here you have the detail of, all, of the maps of all the places. So if you're talking about cartography, here, you have people who have knowledge of the cartography of the different regions. And in the book itself, you have the listing of all the places um, that they sailed to, that they sailed from, the winds, 
and when it would be best to travel. And if you miss um, the trip in three days or five days, then that's it. You'd have to wait for, what, six months or, or eight months before you could go on, go on your journey. So here, like, Malaka is the word. Pulau is not that uh, word there for, for Malaka in the book itself. And then here, just to show you all the crisscrossings of trade that was going on. And, of course, when you come to trade, um, during this time, and it was, if you read um, most of the, the goods, this is, of course, 19th century. I couldn't find examples, but cloth was used as a value of currency. So, in everywhere, in the Malay world, and possibly in the Indian Ocean um, communities, you could see different types of um, cotton, silk from both India and uh, China. But for India, the, the value of um, cloth from India uh, would be most important and it would be used as currency everywhere. And so um, when you look at shipwrecks, for example, it's difficult uh, to use to cloth I mean, to, to look for these artifacts because they would have disintegrated. So there's a possibility that, you know, in the Belitung shipwreck, for example, and other shipwrecks, that there would have been bales and bales of cloth, but, you know, they would have disintegrated. So these are just samples but from the 19th, 20th uh, century. So um, if you look at uh, the map I showed you earlier about the Malay world, for me what is most important is that all these traders outside the world in these different circuits was actually reflected within the Malacca, uh, within the Malacca world. Because in this, um, if you look at the, the, the Portuguese uh, documents, you would see that um, they would be grouped into communities. When you say Gujarati, it wouldn't mean just Gujaratis. The Gujaratis represented everyone from the western part of the world. So it could be Arabs, Persian. They would all be grouped into the community and they live in one community. So the circuits of the world um, that was existing outside was also actually inside within Malacca. So you had the Gujarati community, you had the Kling community, Kling, it's not a good word to use now, but um, uh, this would be the, the Indian uh, community, particularly a Hindu uh, community. And then you have the Javanese community. And when you say Javanese community, this would also include what you would call the Luzones, which would be from Luzon. And then you have uh, the Chinese community. And each community was ruled by a Shabandar. And the, sh the word Shabandar, if you would look at later um, documents of the Portuguese, of the Dutch, the Shabandar is, uh, is still used. And what was the role of the Shabandar? So each community had the Shabandar. This I took from Ken Hall, who worked on the uh, Shabandars as well. Um, they would receive, so the boats would come, you would receive the merchants, you would present the merchants to the Bendahara. So um, this was like uh, one of the uh, heads of the community as well. And then you would have uh, provide the merchants with storage facilities, the gudangs or the godangs for goods and lodging. And then provide the merchants with uh, transport. How would you bring the goods from the ship to the, the Buddha. So you had boats, you had elephants, and, and others. And then to act as trade broker as well for the merchants. So here, you would have all the numbers. 1% of course of the sales of one boat would go to um, the Shabandar. And then he also led his community to fight for Malacca in times of war. So this is the community and then where each community was. So up to now, we go to Malacca. So just inform me if you want to go to Malacca. Um, uh, you would still see these uh, uh, communities and the areas uh, that are talked about there. So here we explain who the Gujaratis were, so that included everybody. 
from um, even those from uh, the Middle East like Aden and Hormuz and then the Mamluk also of Egypt and then you have the Qing also uh, from the South Indian Tamil uh, region and then you have the Javanese and the Javanese here um, very important especially in terms of the ships that they provided they were very good um, masters craftsmen of boats and um, they supplied rice, rice being very important. And here, much later, 1596, Lynch uh, has a vision of how they look like, the Malayos uh, from Malacca, same here. And here are some of, uh, examples of uh, uh, boats that were made then. And then you had the, the Chinese, when you say Chinese, they represented everybody from the East, like China, Champa, Yukyu. And here is uh, from uh, Kansunatense, which is in Rome. So the Codice is still there. And this one is representative of uh, the people of Malacca. So here in Malacca itself, Ome Piresh, if you know, says uh, whoever has Malacca has um, uh, the hands and the throat of Venice, right? Because that, that's what, how important Malacca was. And there are more than 84 languages were spoken. And one of them is uh, the lowest, is the Luzones. Luzones being possibly from the northern part of the Philippines. So they resided in Minjan, a small port northwest of Malacca, where they ran several tin mines and also periodically dispatched ships to China, Japan, and the Philippines. So actually, it was a big community okay, in, in Malacca. So here, aside from talking about the, the big three circuits that I discussed earlier, there were so many also, of course, inter-island uh, uh, trade, as uh, pointed out by uh, historians, and this I took as well from Abulugud. Here, showing again um, the major trade routes that, uh, that were discussed earlier. And so, that was the world the Malacca world. So 1509, Magellan comes into Asia, and this is what he sees, right? And so, I don't know, maybe we can look at his notebooks that will try to indicate what did he see in Malacca that pushed him, you know, to find a different way to go to this part of the world again. So for the Portuguese, like, why do we need to look for another way when we have our own way and we have Malacca and Malacca was already captured. He was part of the 1509 and then 1511 he took a slave and then he, go, he still pushes and says, I want. So maybe that's, that's something we should discuss. So what did he see in Malacca? But he goes on, he gets a slave, Enrique de Malacca, and he proceeds and reaches the Philippines 10 years later. So, 1511, Malacca Falls. 1521, he's in the Philippines. So, what does he see in the Philippines? So, in the Philippines, this is uh, from the Picapeta himself. And the first encounter involves trade. Nine islanders from Suluan arrived with fish, a jar of palm wine, bananas, and coconuts. And in return, the Spaniards sponsored Portuguese-led um, expedition, gave them red caps, mirrors, phones, bells, ivory, bocassin, type of textile, and other items of merchandise. And after two days, two boats returned, and more coconuts, palm wine, oranges, and a cockerel, just one, just one um, chicken. So here, uh, there was an economic uh, historian, Odi Corpus, who says it's small trade, you know, and um, Cebu actually was not really part of a, of a major uh, sea route. That is um, his, his point of view, Corpus. But <coughs> Corpus broad brush caricature has and can be challenged on many counts, but also acknowledges, of course, the uh, varied nature of pre-colonial Philippines. There's not just one 
Uh, but what I want to show is that, of course, 7,000 islands, so many different cultures, more than 100 languages, but we center on Cebu itself, and even Cebu it's itself, even if he says that it wasn't part of a major trading uh, route, but nonetheless, it is unable to explain the sophisticated nature of the gold metal work of, say, the Butuan gold dated to well over like uh, 10th to the 13th centuries. So here, uh, shown were the pintados. I want to uh, relate to you what Pigafetta wrote, and I think this is very important to create an image in your mind. Because for Pigafetta, he said, I will describe to you the most handsome man I have ever met. After this description of Pigafetta, the first time I read it, I had dreams of a handsome man. So what is a handsome man? Okay. So you will have the dreams for nightmares as well. He says, this is Pigafetta's words. And he was the most handsome person whom we saw among those people. He had very black hair on his shoulders, with a silk cloth on his head, and two large gold rings hanging from his ears. He wore a cotton cloth embroidered with silk, with co which covered him from his waist to his knees. At his side, he had a dagger with a long handle and all of gold, the sheath of which was car of carved wood. He wore on his, perfume, per uh, on his person perfumes of storax and benzoin, so he smelled so good. I wonder how close the uh, Pigafetta was. But anyway, he, was, he smelled so good. He, was, he, he smelled of asorax and benzoin. And he was funny and painted all over. So he was painted all over. And his island was called Butuan and Kanagan. So when Raja Palambu and Raja Siawi were asked about the best port to procure provisions, they said, oh, there are three, but the best is uh, Cebu. And when Magellan landed in Cebu, he was asked what he wanted, and he said, oh, I'm really going to the Moluccas, but, you know, I want provisions. And so he says, oh, but if you want provisions, the way uh, to do it is, you know, we have a system. You cannot just come and say, give me uh, rice, and give me chicken, and give me this. There is a ritual. You have to pay tribute. And Magellan says, you know who I am? I'm the, you know who my king is? Uh, I will attack you if, it, okay, okay, okay. So here we see that uh, um, Mabon, the, the, the king who was there of um, Cebu said, okay, don't attack us. We will provide you with goods. Uh, what I want to point out now is from the description of Pigafetta that there was actually system of trade. There were rituals. And so, um, uh, what I want to point out um, and for you to, to look into is, this is the world and these are the things and based on archaeological artifacts, we've found um, uh, thousands of ceramics. And so, what type of trade was going on? And so, uh, here are some photos. So these are all from the Baxter Codex, and possibly years after. So maybe they didn't have uh, clothing like this to cover the tattoos that they had, but that the, the, the cloth would have been important. But I would want you to also look at the gold that they were wearing because of the archaeological uh, deeds that were found. These are just some the gold hundreds of years later your time is over okay so my time is over look at the gold and think of the gold this gold found in the philippines what culture would make would have the technology would have the creative mind to be able to produce this 
and to trade this with others. Thank you.